Alrighty. Well, welcome back to our class, Sacrifice of Christ in the Old and New Testament. So, real quick review. Does anybody remember what a sacrifice was in our last lesson? No, like what? What was a sacrifice? What would we define it as? Yeah, that's part of it. For sin, something had to die, yes. But in a more generic sense, it was when we give up something of value to gain something of greater value. Today, we will look at the burnt offering. Does anyone remember how we find the offering as far as in the Old Testament sense? So how we, what we define the offering as in, as far as the Old Testament sense of offering. <laughs> it's really the sacrifice being offered to God, given to God. Yes, sister. Yes, that would be it. That's full. See, the burnt offering is the most common offering in the scriptures. We find it all throughout the Old Testament, even a slight mention in the New Testament. We'll be primarily looking at Leviticus chapter 1, but before we go there, uh, Ask where is the first mention of a burnt offering in the scriptures? Anybody know? <laughs> that was your homework assignment, Brother Junior. Uh, I think that uh, God made it when He uh, slaughtered the animal and uh, gave the, the skins to Adam and Eve. And well, that was bur first sacrifice, but actually the first time mention of a burnt offering. Actually, it was earlier than that. Oh. <laughs> yeah, Adam has an advantage. He's already seen all this. <laughs> Abel probably offered a burnt offering, but we're not told that. The first actual mention uh, is Noah. Oh, when he came off. Yep. Uh, Genesis chapter 8, verses 20 and 21. Abraham's offering was an important one. I plan to look at it later. But in Genesis 8, verse 20 through 21, the Bible says, And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground for any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. This was the first thing Noah did after he came off the ark was he built an altar and offered to God. And we notice it was a sweet savor or a, you know, a pleasant smell, if you will, to God. Yeah, the clean, he took seven, I believe. And he, and he obviously used those to offer sacrifices to God. And as we see, we'll see here in a moment, it's even more significant because this was not... Under the law, the burnt offering was actually a voluntary offering. It wasn't a required offering. But much like it was in Noah's day, it was it's called a sweet savor unto God, even in Leviticus. Kind of a comment to go along with something Brother Adam had taught recently. He says, For the imagina imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. You know, man doesn't get more wicked as we saw. He's evil all the way from his youth, the Bible says here. Yeah. <laughs> Certainly, he displays his wickedness maybe more and more, but he's as wicked as he's ever going to be. <laughs> right. You know, even in the animals that Noah offered, 
Yes, and that was another point. Uh, he can only offer clean animals. Mm -hmm. you know, what you offer is important in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. You couldn't just sacrifice any old thing. Like I said, it has to be something of value, something of importance to be really a sacrifice. All right, let's go on to Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 1. We'll go ahead and read through the whole chapter, and I'll stop and make some comments as we're going. It is interesting to note that Leviticus starts with and, so it's a continuation of the previous books of Moses. It says, And the Lord, verse 1, called unto Moses and spake unto him out of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, If any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, ye shall bring your offering of the cattle, even of the herd and of the flock. If his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him, other, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. Here he says, You shall bring your offering of the cattle, even of the herd and of the flock. Cattle is used kind of a generic sense of livestock here cows oxen sheep goats all those could be used for the burnt offering and here he says it was had to be a male without blemish you couldn't bring the the lame or the sick or the one that was about to die <laughs> it really it points to christ how he was without spot and without blemish he was the perfect sacrifice and it had to be a male it says just as christ was he says, he shall offer it of his own voluntary will. This points to how Christ voluntarily gave himself for us. Well, certainly, it was the will of God that he would do so, but he completely submitted himself to God. And again, that's really how the burnt offering, the main point of the burnt offering is that it's complete giving yourself to God, complete consecration to God, if you will. Sometimes the scripture will say free will offering. That includes this offering and the next two that we'll look at. All first three offerings were considered voluntary offerings. The sin and trespass offering were not called voluntary offerings. Here he says he shall offer it at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. Well, he was, it's to offer openly here, just as Christ was offered openly. You know, it wasn't done in the tabernacle. It was done, it says, at the door of the tabernacle. Verse 4, it says that he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. Placing the head on the hand on the head, kind of identified, if you will, the offer, offering with the offer, it, that it was taking its place just as Christ took our place. Now, atonement means to cover or to purge. Now, in this particular instance, doesn't necessarily mean for sin, even though it, you know, since it does. But rather, it shows, burnt offering shows complete dedication to God. And yes, taking care of sin is part of that. And the New Testament says that we are to give our bodies as a living sacrifice just as the burnt offering was to be totally consumed so our lives are to be totally consumed by the service of God right. let's continue on to verse 5 here he goes on to the details of how to kill the offering and he which I believe is referring back to the offer shall kill the bullock before the Lord and the priest Aaron's sons, you'll see this phrase Aaron's son or sons of Aaron or sometimes Aaron and his sons used throughout Leviticus because they were at this time the priesthood but Aaron's sons the priest shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood around about upon the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation here they I'm told they were caught they caught the blood in a basin and then they took it to the altar and sprinkled it 
which as we'll see when we get into the New Testament, Christ, his blood was sprinkled on the altar for us, just the same. In verse 6 it says, He shall flay the burnt offering, that is to skin it, and cut it into his pieces. Leviticus 7 verse 8, we don't have to turn there, but it indicates that the priest was allowed to keep the skin for himself. I imagine it was part of sustaining the priest as they were often given a portion of the sacrifice to to sustain them. I, I know in that time they oftentimes used uh, skins to make clothes and whatnot, so I imagine that provided for their needs in that aspect. But he says that he cut it into his pieces. You know, it wasn't some arbitrary slicing up but they cut it probably partially for practical reasons because you couldn't pick a whole ox up and sit on the altar but also in Psalms 22 the scripture says that speaking of Christ that all his bone, bones were out of joints mm -hmm. which indicates which is kind of indicative here of separating the bones if you will it really indicates how that Christ suffered in every aspect of his body, every from the head to his toe. Right. It says in verse 7, And the sons of Aaron the priest shall put fire upon the altar and lay the wood in order upon the fire. So the priest, they built the fire. Well, some Jewish traditions teach that God rich the, lit the original fire from heaven and then the priest kept it going. If you're, you know, brother, brother Larry mentioned Abraham's sacrifice. If you remember Isaac's words there in Genesis 22, he said, "Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for burnt offering?" Right. We'll turn and look at that in a little more detail. But the fire and the wood were there, but the burnt offering, what was to be offered there, is the important part of it. Verse 8, it says, And the priest Aaron's son shall lay the parts, the head, and the fat in order upon the wood that is on the fire, which is upon the altar. But verse 9 says, But his innards and his legs shall he wash in water, and the priest shall burn all on the altar to be a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. It was to wash his, it says, innards and his legs. That really showed inward purity as well as outward purity. Also, in all this cutting up and washing, you saw that inwardly he didn't have any impurities, if you will. Inwardly he wasn't without blemish as well, just as Christ, both outwardly and inwardly, was without blemish. Notice there it says, And the priest shall burn all on the altar to a burnt offering, or burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire, or sweet savor unto the Lord. All of it was to be burned, none of it was to be left. just as Christ was in his flesh totally consumed in his sacrifice really throughout his life his life was totally consumed by the service of God as well and it was a, it says a sweet savor unto the Lord like I said that's a a pleasant or delightful smell or odor it was a pleasing thing to God this burnt offering just as Christ's sacrifice was, was pleasing to God as well go on to the next verse here the next set of verses are somewhat repetitive of what we just read but this is if you're bringing of the flock which is the sheep or the goats verse 10 it says and if his offering be of the flock namely of the sheep or of the goats for a burnt offering he shall bring it a male without blemish see, once again we see it has to be a male without blemish and he shall kill it on the side of the altar northward before the Lord and the priest Aaron's son shall sprinkle his blood round about upon the altar. Here's one difference that is not mentioned with the bullock. It's to be killed on the north side of the altar. It's said that Calvary was north of Jerusalem. He was definitely killed outside of Jerusalem. 
which indicates that, like here, he was not killed right at the altar, but past the altar on the north side. You know, there's some debate on exactly where Calvary's Hill is, but pretty much all accounts put it somewhere north, northwest of the old city of Jerusalem. Verse 12 and 13 are pretty much the same as we read before, and he shall cut into pieces with his head and his fat, and the priest shall lay them in order on the wood that is on the fire which is on the altar, and he shall wash his innards and his legs with water, and the priest shall bring it all and burn it upon the altar. It is a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire, a sweet savor unto the Lord. Same as verses 6 through 9 we just read. Let's go on to verse 14 here. The offering is a, a little different. Really, God makes provision for even the poorer people in the land that they could make burnt offering. In verse 14, it says, And if the burnt sacrifice for his offering to the Lord be of fowls, he shall bring his offering of turtle doves or of young pigeons. Oh, these were clean birds. They weren't just any old bird that you could find. But in the case of someone who was able to afford a, an ox or a sheep or a goat, God provided even for them to bring the fowls, just as God really provided in Christ sacrifice for all who believe on him. Right. You know, you don't have to be of notoriety. You can be of low estate. Yet Christ can still provide for your needs spiritually. Verse 15, the, all, the sacrifice was prepared a little differently in this case. It says, And the priest shall bring it unto the altar and wring off his head and burn it on the altar, and the blood thereof shall be wrung out at the side of the altar. And he shall pluck away his crop with his feathers and cast it beside the altar on the east part by the place of the ashes. And the crop is where... The, the bird takes and stores their food and prepares it for digestion. It's really the equivalent of the the innards of the, mentioned in the previous sacrifices. And he was defeathered, if you will. He was plucked, just like the others were skinned. In verse 17, he cuts it. He says, And you shall clave it with the wings thereof, but shall not divide it asunder. And the priest shall burn it upon the altar, upon the wood, is, or upon the wood that is upon the fire, it is a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of sweet savor unto the Lord. Do you have any comments on the ring? That ring was really took and kind of just rung it off. I really wasn't sure about how that directly laid to Christ other than he will, it really shows his suffering again you know, I didn't find any direct parallels if you will because obviously even though they did you know crown him with thorns and beat him so I at the very least it Shows even more of his sufferings. So I can't imagine having your head wrung off felt very good. <laughs> well, you know, there was no, the prediction said there'd be no bones, so there could be, there could be anything there. But it's when you bring a chicken, it, it breaks the neck. Right. Yeah. Think it had anything to do with uh, Judas? And what aspect do you mean by that, brother? Judas. They stripped the skin off the others. They stripped the feathers off of this. But no, I maybe if I come across anything, I'll. Yeah, 
Yeah, he was not to break it. They were just supposed to cut it. It says here, he shall cleave it with the wings thereof, but shall not divide it asunder. As well, I want to make note here in a little bit, but these passages in Leviticus seem to indicate when you look at the offerings that Mary and Joseph offer that they might have been a poor, might have been poorer folks, if you will. Because right. yeah. go to Luke chapter two here, towards the end, I want, three of the primary things to take away from the burnt offering, though, were that it was to be a male without blemish, signifying Christ, how he was without blemish, how that he was without sin. It was a voluntary sacrifice, just as Christ voluntarily gave himself. And it was to com be completely consumed on the altar, which indicates complete consecration to God. I didn't... I put a note down for these, but I didn't include them in my slides. But let's turn for just a moment to Malachi, or we'll look at Leviticus since we're already there. Leviticus chapter 22. Oh, if I can get there. <laughs> Leviticus 22, 22. And giving details on what the sacrifices should be. Yeah, really what they shouldn't be. It says, blind or broken or maimed or having a wind or scurvy or scabbed, you shall not offer these unto the Lord, nor make an offering by fire of them upon the altar unto the Lord. You know, these were things you shouldn't offer to God. Blind, broken, maimed. Having a wind, which is a running wound. Scurvy, which is a, in the case of, you know, usually scabbed over from scratching so much. You know, or scabbed, you shall not offer these unto the Lord, he says. Remember, a sacrifice has to be something that's you know, of value, but even more so, it had to be without blemish because Christ was to be without blemish. The problem was we find in Malachi chapter 1 that these are exactly what Israel was offering. Malachi chapter 1 verse 8. Well, if you go ahead and read back to verse 7 as well. He says, Ye offer polluted bread upon mine altar, and ye say, Wherein have we polluted thee? And that ye say the table of the Lord is contentable. Notice verse 8, though. He says, And if ye offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto thy governor. Will he be pleased with thee or accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts? You wouldn't uh, take your old sick dying cow and <laughs> you wouldn't probably take it to your friend and say, here, here's your meal, would you? Yeah, that's the way most do it today, both with their tithes and offerings and with their life. You know, you give whatever's left instead of giving the best to God. None of those things were pleasing to God, and all those things are really a disservice to Christ, if you will. I'd like to look at a few noticeable, notable scriptures regarding burnt offerings. I think we all know Genesis chapter 22. This was Abraham's offering of Isaac to God. I don't intend to spend a lot of time on these, but Genesis 22 verses 1 through 13 It says, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and say it, said unto him, and that tempt means that he tried him, if you will, 
not that he tempted him with evil. Abraham, he said, Behold, here am I. And he said, Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and go and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clayed the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went under the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I will, or I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and come again to you. Abraham, you know, Abraham had to have faith to make that statement, didn't he? Though that he, him, and the young lad would come back. But really what God was trying Abraham with here to see if he was totally committed to him. Right. If you're not familiar, Isaac was his only son that he had waited, I forget how many years for. Of course, he tried to do it his own way a time or two and that didn't work out too good. But right. Isaac was the promised son, and yet here God tells him to offer it to him. Logically speaking, that's we'd say that wouldn't make much sense. Would well, God, you told me he's going to be my heir, and he's going to be as the sand of the sea. My seed will be, and here you are telling me to kill him. But really, we're to offer everything to God, whatever he requires. See, verse 6, he said, Abraham took the burnt offering, or took the wood of the burnt offering, and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand, and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham, here's what we were referring to earlier, his father, and said, My father? And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? You know, I don't know how old Isaac was. He had to be of somewhat of mature age to understand what was going on here. But I don't know if he understood exactly what was going on at this point. He said, you know, we got this fire and we got this wood, but we don't have anything to offer to God. <laughs> Here's a verse which we'll come back to again. Where it says, And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. Certainly God literally provided them a sacrifice. But it also points to Christ, how the Christ would provide himself I see here a lamb for a burnt offering. And they came to the place, verse 9, which God had told of, told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took his knife to slay his son. Abraham was fully ready to do that which he was required of God. Right. I dare say it many times we are not so ready to do that. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou any thing unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, and seest thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind, or, yeah, behold behind him a ram caught in a thicket, by his thorns, and Abraham went and took the ram and offered him for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. God always provides when we just trust him. Right. I said, Tim. He doesn't tempt with evil, but he does try us, if you will, test us, if you will. <laughs> no, God doesn't tempt. He might, if I could say it, allow us to be tempted, but he definitely tests our faith. And that's what was going on here with Abraham, testing him and see you. 
It wasn't really to see if. Yeah. Say, I don't know that it was so much that God needed to see what Abraham would do, but Abraham needed to see what he would do. Yeah, usually God already has the exactly. the need taken care of before we even have the need. Yeah, one uh, one person speaking on Zacchaeus, he said that tree was already planted before Zacchaeus ever needed to see Jesus. Let's go over to First Kings. This is a quite notable notable burnt offering and. And that God Himself consumed it. First Kings chapter eighteen, verses twenty-one through thirty-nine, tell about Elijah. He had came before the prophets of Baal. He made him a made a challenge, if you will. And if you're familiar with the context here, they were in them somewhere in the midst of that three and a half year drought, where there was no rain at all. Just remember that as we read through here. Verse 21 says, And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I, only remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. God's people are usually not in the majority. It says, Let them therefore give us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves and cut it into pieces and lay it on the wood and put no fire under. And I will dress the other bullock and lay it on wood and put no fire under. And call ye on the name of your gods and I will call on the name of the Lord and the God that answereth by fire let him be God. And all the people answered and said it is well spoken. So here Elijah said well they'll prepare a sacrifice and I'll prepare one but we won't put any fire under it. And we'll see which God answers. We go on to verse 25. It says, And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose you one bullock for yourselves, and dress it first. For ye are many, and call upon the name of your gods, but put no fire under. So he even let them choose which one to offer. They could choose the finest of the two. And they took the bullock which was given them, and dressed it, and called on the name of Baal from morning even unto noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. There was no voice nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made, and it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awaked. You know, they got mad. They were jumping on the altar and saying, Why aren't you doing nothing? And Elijah kind of made fun of him. He said, Maybe he's busy doing something else. Well, the God of Israel, he never slumbereth nor sleepeth. Verse 28, it says, And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. You know, I don't know exactly what they, their regular custom was, but apparently it involved cutting themselves. It says they, they cried out, they cut themselves, which I think was trying to get the attention of Baal. But he didn't answer. And it says, And it came to pass when midday was past, and they prophesied unto the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. They had went all day long. And it says that there was neither voice nor any to answer nor any that regarded. Their sacrifice was unsuccessful because they were offering it to the wrong God. And Elijah said unto the people, verse 30, Come near unto me, and I... All the people came near unto him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. He had the right altar, too. Right. <laughs> and Elijah took twelve stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. 
So he built this altar. Whenever God had an altar built, it was built of stone. He says he built this trench around it, and he put the wood in order and cut the bullock in pieces and laid him on the wood. Well, he went farther. He didn't just have a dry one. He says, fill four barrels of water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. You know, like I mentioned, they were in the middle of somewhere in the middle of a three and a half year drought. Water wasn't very uh, plentiful, if you will. Yeah. And then notice what he says in verse 34. He says, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. He said, do it a third time. They did it a third time. So three times they filled up four barrels of water, poured on the burnt offering on the wood. I don't know about you, but burnt wood's hard to burn. I mean, w wet wood is hard to burn. Verse 36, though, it said, or verse 35 says, And the water ran around the altar and filled the trench also with water. So he had wet wood, he had a wet offering, and he had water all around it. He didn't he didn't have the ideal uh, circumstances, if you will, for a fire. But verse 36 says, And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that the, this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned the heart back again, or their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces. And they said, The Lord is Jehovah. He is the God. The Lord, He is the God. He, God, Elijah called unto the, the God of Israel, Jehovah, if you will. The Lord, as we call Him. And it says, He sent fire from heaven. And the fire of the Lord fell. And it consumed not only the burnt offering, but it consumed the wood and the stones and the dust, and it even licked up the water that was in the trench. Yep. Well, that was a a real fire, wasn't it? That was a all-consuming fire. Yeah, God doesn't have a problem setting wet wood on fire and it wasn't just a little wet it was soaked with water he doesn't even have a problem it says here consuming the stones and the dust and even the water that was in the trench really that just shows once again that the complete consumption of the burnt offering and how that in type Christ was completely consumed in his sacrifice We'll go on and look at two other uh, notable scriptures. Job chapter 1, verse 5. There's a lot of debate about Job when it was written, when it took place, who wrote it. I don't profess to have all the answers to that, or much of any of the answers to it, actually. I do know that Job lived before Ezekiel's time, for he references him. He references him alongside Noah and Daniel as t types of righteous men. The only other place Job is mentioned in the scriptures is in the book of James. When he says, You have heard the patience of Job and seen in the Lord that he is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Aside from that, Job is not really mentioned outside of the book of Job much. It is interesting to note that Ezekiel's uh, prophecy where he mentions him, it's in two verses, I forget the chapter. He said, you know, if we remember back to Abraham when he was kind of interceding on Sodom and Gomorrah's part, he said, well, if there's, you know, 50 righteous in the city, will you destroy it? And he goes all the way down to 10. And Ezekiel's 
uh, prophecy. He says that, really speaking, I think it's of Jerusalem and Israel. He says, well, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in there. They would be the only three that were saved. I mean, that they were the only ones that were would be righteous. It was a really a great judgment pronounced upon the people there. But Job lived in the land of Uz, which is also debatable where it was exactly. I think it was near Israel. Uh, I think it's also it's Jeremiah mentions it as the Edomites dwelled in the land of Uz. When verse five, verse four, we'll read. It says, "And his sons went and feasted, speaking of Job's sons, in their houses, every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them." Well, there's a questionable actions there. What exactly they were doing? If it was as innocent as some might think it to be, it seems that they were pardoning it up. Verse five says, "And it was so when the days of their feastings were gone, about were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them, and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all." For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. So here Job offered burnt offerings to God. And it says he did it on behalf of his, at least his sons here. And he says, For it may be that they have sinned. I'm sure there wasn't a whole lot of maybe about it, but. This is really the only time you find someone offering to burn offerings on behalf of someone else. The offerer was to come and to offer it. The offerer was to come and kill it himself. So we don't know exactly if Job lived before the time that Mosaic Law was given. Most assume that he was, but Scripture doesn't say that. But we do know that he offered this burnt offering and he tried to do it on behalf of his sons as well. Uh, I don't think that Job was punished for that, but we do know he suffered a lot and he lost his sons. Right. So I'm not sure that his offering for them was accepted. Yeah, he didn't do it just once, I don't think. It seems like he just kept on offering them. It seems like they were not a... It seems like they were not only up to their duties to offer burnt offerings to God. Well, I don't know what kind of parent Job was, but he seemed to at least care about his children. Maybe he was a little too blind, if you will, to what they were really doing, what their state was. I'd like to look at, in one place in the New Testament, this was not quite as clear, if you will, but burnt offering is taking place here. I thought it was interesting because it's the quote unquote parents of Christ, Mary and Joseph. Luke chapter 2, verse 22 through 24. Mary had already had Christ. And he, if you're familiar with the Levitical law, chapter 12 of Leviticus gives details on. After a woman had a child, she was to be unclean for a certain time, then go through a time of purification, and then she was to offer burnt offerings and sin offerings before God. That's in Leviticus 12, verses 1 through 8. Interestingly enough, a male child, she was unclean for a week and had to purify herself for 33 days. For a female child, it was double that of both of those. But verse 20. Two here it says that when he came, or excuse me, I'm in chapter one, verse chapter two it says that when the days of her, speaking of Mary, perfect purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him, speaking of Christ, to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and is every firstborn male, and in Verse 24 says, And to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. 
So we don't have to turn there and look at it. But in Leviticus 12, it says that they were bring a lamb or a goat and then a turtle dove, one for a burnt offering, another for a sin offering. But it does make provision for those that couldn't afford a lamb. And it says they could bring two turtle doves or two pigeons. Here it indicates that that's what they brought was two turtle doves or two pigeons. I imagine Joseph and Mary weren't exactly well-to-do folks. Which just goes along with how Christ lived his life and how he was prophesied to come. He wasn't prophesied to come in all sorts of glory and honor and riches, but meek and lowly. Right. So they really don't find much more we don't find any more examples of burnt offering. We will see some more explanation of it when we get to the book of Hebrews. But this really is the last time we see an actual burnt offering and as you'll know, uh, not too many years later, in the AD 70, the temple is destroyed. Right. The Jews are driven from their land and scattered throughout the world. And even to the day, they do not offer offerings unto God. Now, next week, uh, we'll be looking at the meat offering. Now, the meat offering is not the way we think of it, meat as in steak or something like that. It's meat as in food. I'll give you a little bit of homework. If you can find the significance of oil in the scriptures, I think most of us probably know that one, but also what the importance of frankincense is. Both are off, Both are part of the meat offering. If you want to read ahead, we'll go to Leviticus chapter 2 next week to examine the details of that offering. Right. Any questions or comments before we close? It does seem to indicate there that they took it, and took it straight out of the body and put it on there. fact that none of the blood was wasted. Just as certainly none of Christ's blood was wasted on the cross. That's a deeper subject someone would like to debate you about, but I think he... Uh, uh, Exodus does talk a lot about these offerings as well that they were to do them. It doesn't really tell us much detail about what they were, but they did mention offering these offerings even in the wilderness. Right, and so that shows that they were eating manna while they were sacrificing. So what could have been good to eat, they were giving to the Lord, which again gets back to first things first. Well, they were sacrificing. Saying they had. Saying they, yeah, they had. They could have, you know, chopped them up, had some steak and some hamburgers, and. Uh, we like to take the finest and give God the leftovers, though, don't we? Yeah, they eventually get the. You know, they were a lot like us. They get out of the will of the Lord, then 
they come back in for a little while, then they go back out again. Well, I think they did. Well, they, they, they waited until they got to the promised land, didn't they? I imagine sanitary was or sanitation was hard enough in the wilderness. Right. <laughs> no, you were a little sore after that for a while, especially in those days. Right. Yeah, if you remember, that's how was it Jacob took advantage of those that uh, Dinah well if nothing else will be closed for the night that was good